And last but not least, <laughs> I refer to this as uh, friends and family time at OCP. Everybody's looking to get to their, get to their planes. Um, so we've had a lot of discussion about DCMHS. We've had a lot of the what. Um, I want to back off a little bit to the why, um, particularly focusing on off-the-shelf servers and, and why we're doing a lot of the things that we're doing. Um, now, first, before we get there, let me introduce, I'm Mark Ashaw. I'm a principal architect at Microsoft. I've been working for a number of years in past years at Microsoft and currently with Google with Mac, who uh, you probably have all seen up here for about the last three hours. <laughs> um, it's, it's been great working with Mark. Um, we cover similar territories in some areas and complementary uh, aspects of the problem in some other areas. Uh, it's been great partnership with, with Mark. I spell my name a little bit differently, though, but that's okay. That, that, that'll teach you to uh, spell check. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so let's start off with the problem statement, right? Um, how do we enable an increasing matrix of servers into a constrained data center, right? If you were to see the, the number of use cases that are proliferating, all of those use cases are wanting a server that's optimized for those use cases. And, uh, in, and to create all of those opportunities for people while trying to do so in a way in which data centers aren't just overwhelmed by the amount of unicorns flowing I was getting feedback earlier, um, is, is a challenge to us, right? Um, and it's a challenge for people doing off-the-shelf servers to overcome the barriers of entry, right? How do, they, how do they plan to build a server for us when we've got very evolving requirements, right? And not only that, but we want that server not only with everything that we want, but we want it in time for time to market, and we want it at lower costs. So there's a ton of barriers and challenges to doing that. I'm going to hit on a few of them. There's lots more, um, but we're limited in time. So I want to talk a little about server management. I want to talk about security. I want to talk about networking. And then I kind of want to close it up with um, you know, talking about the impact on the data center. And the impact in data center is really in kind of in terms of human suffering, right? We can do a lot of things, and the data center gets to clean it up at the end, but that's not being a good real partner with our data center. So we, we kind of want to get through all those challenges and produce something that our data center can deploy and manage. So server management, right? Server management for hyperscalers is very personalized to the service provider, right? If you look at Microsoft and Google, you know, we, you probably won't see the same BMC. You won't see the same BMC firmware. You will see that they do in-band, we do out-of-band. Um, our firmware updates are different. The telemetry that we gather has overlaps, but is very different, right? Everybody is putting, the amount of telemetry we gather off of servers is massive. You could just about be your own service provider in terms of storage for the telemetry that we're gathering off of our fleet. Um, we manage things different in terms of power. You know, some people like to be able to log into a BMC and order a server to turn on and off. Some people see, how do I trust that a BMC is there so that I can turn the server on and off? I, I, want, a, I want a hard wire. Right? There's tons of different ways in which people manage the servers. And then we get into a little bit into fault resiliency of you know, how should a server behave when a BMC isn't there? How do we get that BMC to auto-recover? Um, different requirements for different companies. Different companies have different, uh, what I would say, uh, uh, barriers, right? Things that they're willing to live with um, in terms of the reliability of their fleet. Now, what did we do in order to overcome that, right? You see a picture of DCSCM. DCSCM is intended to address literally all of those so that I can walk into my data center um, and deploy something that is common across, for, across, uh, across my servers and not have a ton of different differentiation between them so that we can manage them more efficiently. Uh, just uh, go ahead. The, the word DC or the designation in front of DCSCM signifies the data center ready. So the idea uh, when we came up with this concept a long time ago was encapsulate all the requirements for a server to be able to fit within a data center in one module. So if you, ha if you implement DCSCM for Microsoft, then the concept was that that particular server would fit within the particular uh, security and management framework required of Microsoft or, or of Google. So this is one of the touch points. It's not the only touch point, but one of the touch points can be encapsulated into the DCSCM. 
Second aspect, security. Um, if you go next door to Google, Google has Titan. Wonderful security solution. Microsoft has Cerberus, and even possibly that much better, more wonderful security <laughs> solution. Right? Um, but I guarantee you that when we both design those things, since then our security teams have come to us 100 times with improvements. Um, and we don't have the luxury of saying, that's a great improvement. I'll tell you what, in three years at the next generation, I will be glad to implement that, right? It's we don't, just simply in a security environment, we don't have that luxury. When, if you ask us, uh, if you ask the security person, what are the requirements for security for this generation, they just tell you more. Um, so they're just constantly evolving. Um, we've got attestation, I call it attestation creep, right? We're, we're attesting the BMC, we're attesting the BIOS. Well, now we're attesting the NIC. Um, Past generation, we started attesting CP, uh, power supplies. Um, now we're attesting CPLDs. I, I joke half jokingly, but I know it's coming. We'll attest fans at some point, right? We're going to have to make sure that everything in that server is per hour, meets our security. And that means that when somebody delivers a server to us, those same expectations are going to get meet. That's a barrier to entry. Um, coming up, high speed and uh, low speed link encryption, the passing of keys securely and uh, between uh, from, from a host or a management entity into our encryption engines um, is, going to, is, is coming, right? Again, all kind of tied to DCSCM, right, where we try to pull all of those things off so that we can provide our solution into a off-the-shelf server and overcome those barrier to entries because it really wasn't acceptable for people to come to us with, here's a great solution, this would do great in your data center, and we say, Thank you very much. Now, if you would just redesign the motherboard and put these things in, we'll ship it next month. Right. So let's, let's just summarize by, again, calling this one of the touch points. Um, we will talk about several touch points. One of the touch points is the uh, DCSCM. If we, um, we can identify what the requirement for DCSCM is, and the suppliers can build to that particular requirement, either build it on their own or allow our DCSCM to plug into the system. Either way, it works. Uh, in that model, one particular touch point is covered. That is basically out-of-band control touch point. Uh, it includes security, management, telemetry, and um, basically the type of thing that we would like people to, we would like to encourage people to run things on open VMC. Okay. Um, next barrier, networking. Um, there's a lot of great networking solutions, but the emerging smart NIC market is becoming a disruptive force for us. Um, Microsoft has been shipping smart NICs in the terms of FPGAs for a number of years. I am sure that other hyperscalers are looking very closely at smart NICs, but when you look at a smart NIC, um, you see an FPGA, you see a SOC, you see a full height half length PCIe card that is bursting at the seams in many ways. Um, our smart NIC is actually full height half length plus 20 millimeters, right? It's spa very space constrained because it's got that extra sock. It's power constrained. Um, they came to me and said, okay, PCIe form factor, I can fit it on there. I said, great, 75 watts? No, not quite 75, but it's around there. Um, we're power constrained. And then as we go start going into PCIe Gen 6, a PCIe form factor card sitting up on a riser um, is going to be a challenge. So. Uh, and then you look at the management of it. Uh, I squared C is not sufficient, right? I think every smart NIC car that I've seen has either been, uh, I would like USB 3, I would like PCIe, I would like Ethernet, right? There's no singular solution for management of these cards. So we're busting at the form factor, and I think that uh, one of the key things going forward for us is going to be working within the OCP body to, to kind of standardize this form factor um, in a much more, I would say pleasant <laughs> way than what we currently do with, with uh, PCIe form factors. So this uh, is the second touch point. So the first touch point was out of band management. Uh, second touch point is the in band management encapsulated in what we can call smart NIC, IPU, DPU. Um, the form factor itself, the amount of power and interfaces to that are the um, ingredients and eventually the firmware that runs on that. Those are the essential elements of the second touch point. Uh, so far, this, the first two touch points um, had 
not only mechanical, thermal, and physical elements, basically hardware, but it also encapsulate a lot of software elements. Um, the type of things that um, when you deploy servers into data centers, software guys, the people who do RMA, maintenance, uh, interface the system using these two touch points, out-of-band management or in-band management. So a lot of software, a lot of procedures, a lot of requirements come out of security and management using these two touch points. So there's not only hardware, but a lot of software that is associated with it. Um, so that is the type of thing that we need to be able to communicate to our suppliers so that when they build things on their own, uh, basically as an off-the-shelf system on their own, they can build it, they can uh, qualify it, run testing on it before they even deliver it to us. That would be the best solution if we can accomplish that. And since, every, and since everything is in that list is different from smart card vendor to smart vendor, right, if we don't accomplish standardization of it, um, that's just a, it's an increasingly difficult challenge for them. Right. Uh, standardization, we can do at two levels, uh, hardware level or um, interface software yep. level. Uh, either one is um, acceptable. I, I believe software guys will be happy. They might not care. Software guys might not care the um, shape of the hardware as long as it has the same interfaces, as long as it, 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 it performs the same security level. Uh, but hardware guys do care. The guys who want to place these things into uh, the data center do care. So those come on the second, uh, third and fourth touch points we will talk in a minute. And kind of maybe this last touch point um, is data center impact. And the first three are barriers, right? Do you, if you show up with a server and it's unable to accomplish the first three, it's not deployable. Um, but it can be able to accomplish those first three and it's still challenged with our data center. Now, this is maybe a softer barrier, right? And I always, I like, I love the, like the phrase human suffering, right? This is where, you know, I don't want my data center to have to be superhuman, <laughs> you know, and I want them to love me at the end of the day, not hate me. So I want them to, this, these servers to be able to go through in, into a, through a deployment cycle with as least amount of perturbation in the system as possible so that we're not, you know, delayed three to six months trying to deploy something that should have been deployed in a matter of weeks. So, you know, some of the barriers, right, is we've got rack standards of 19-inch ORV2, ORV3. We've got 12 kilowatt racks, 17 kilowatt racks, 34 kilowatts. These are all things that have to be understood and planned for ahead of time before they get near a data center. Um, once we have, you know, a solution in a rack, right, we have to get it into the data center. We have to run wire checks. We have to have diagnosability. We have to have, be able to take something into OFR and repair it and then bring it back online. And, uh, you know, these are things that DCSEM helps with, but we also have to understand the, the infrastructure behind that so that we can do these things. Um, and those things take planning to do. And then we get into service models, right? Most hyperscalers are self-maintainers, right? We don't really want a lot of people running around our data centers. We want a data center team that is trained. But, uh, you know, and we, but the more service things that they have to deal with, right, the more unicorns they have to deal with, the less efficient they're going to be. And OFR time and keeping things running in the data center is, of course, super important. Um, and in order to speed things up, right, we have different types of, uh, of service models, right? We have in-rack. Microsoft personally prefers in-rack. We don't want people to have to lift things out of the, out of the rack. We want to be able to, to pull, the, pull them out of the rack, replace, them really, replace things really quickly, replace high service items really quickly, and go back. There are others that prefer crash carts. They want to lift it out of the rack, put it on a crash cart, deal with it there rather than rack. Now, there's pros and cons to both, but um, you know, data centers are going to tend to be a little bit skewed toward being proficient at one or the other, right? If you bring something that has, needs crash cart service into a data center that's largely in rack, well, when that crash cart's needed, it's about a mile and a half away, right? So, um, so we try want to you know, kind of uh, push our vendors into aligning with us and, and making sure we're aligned on how we do service. And then part of the beauty of modularity, right, is uh, enabling spares, right? Every time we put a new thing in a data center, uh, we're not just buying one that goes into it. Everything that goes into that server has to have spares along with it. So the more different types of things we have, the more spares that we have to go, the more we have to stock spares, track spares, um, be able to produce spares within X amount of time, so limiting the number of things that we do 
in a, in a time in which we're trying to service all of these different uh, um, uh, use cases is a, very much a challenge. And it's one of the reasons why you know, I like DCSM, I like modularity, um, because it can really help us in that aspect also. So uh, the collection of things on this slide can turn into the third and uh, fourth touch points. Um, power delivery and rackification. Um, within data center, hyperscale data centers, the, the way you produce power and deliver it to the individual chassis are different from the way that enterprise class uh, data centers do that. Um, size of the racks are slightly different as well, and the way that power comes to the rack are different as well. So the second, uh, first and second items were the type of things that touched on uh, software and DCMHS as a modularity concept address the hardware aspect of it. What's in front of us is to work together to also articulate what these software elements are. And top of a couple of um, uh, concepts were discussed yesterday, the day before. Tint and Fish is an example. Cloud Service Model is another example of the type of things that the software guys from top down are trying to address so that we hardware guys from bottom up can produce devices that can meet the software and security models that uh, our software guys require. So the first and second could be addressed by DCMHS, Modular Hardware System. The third and fourth one can be addressed at the rack level. Perhaps Open Rack V3 might be a methodology that we can describe our requirements uh, in a generic way so that the suppliers can adhere to. So if, if a chassis is um, compliant with ORV3, and if we, in the future, uh, comply to uh, ORV3 rack solutions, then it is more likely for solutions that um, suppliers build uh, can find their ways in an off-the-shelf way into our data centers without too much modification. So mod modular hardware system, touching on the first two o ORV3, basically two projects within OCP can address this uh, third and fourth one. What is not covered is the maintenance and RMA policies that those things might be different in different uh, data centers based on their um, sensitivity to who could be in which data centers, what type of privileges they might have. Those pr procedures might be different, but at some point we should articulate those things as well so that the whole solution can be done. For the, sli for the slide you've all been waiting for, right? Call to action, last slide. Um, so call to action is we want to identify the challenges and promote collaboration through standard bodies such as OCC, OCP. Some of the great results that we've gotten out of that, DCSCM, DCMHS, NIC 3.0, OpenBMC, um, DC Stack. Um, and now we want to look to the, you know, those are kind of things that are in WIP right now. Now we're starting, but we're also trying, trying to look to the future and identify, you know, emerging technologies and develop the partnerships and start the standards discussions around key things like CXL-based memory, right, um, and smart NIC. So, I'm sure there are others, but you know, those are the two probably biggest hot and but hot button topics for me, certainly in, in the coming, uh, I think, this, in the coming year, um, because those are the things that are going to be uh, impacting next generation servers. Right, so, so I, can, I can say that we have very good handle. We, as a community of OCP, have good handle of DCSCM, DCMHS, NIC3, um, OpenBMC as well. But DC stack is still uh, raw. Uh, we have ideas, we have concepts, but we have not worked together on um, software ensemble of the type of infrastructure software is required to make DC stack happen. Today, we did have a, a talk that described what DC stack might be from Google's point of view, but uh, we need to speak about it more uh, openly and uh, invite other people, other companies to join and come up with uh, test and validation suite that might be um, interchangeable so that suppliers can have uh, their own uh, qualification matrix running on, you could call it standard test and validation uh, flow. Test and validation is one of the initiatives within uh, OCP. 
Um, they, they meet on Wednesdays. That's a very active team. Uh, please um, participate, provide your feedback, and help them develop some code for that. And then all, out of all of that, then we will have new technologies that are coming in, uh, <laughs> creating new challenges. CXL, uh, as we have talked about, is uh, a fertile ground for new uh, capabilities. New systems need to be developed. But if we do our foundational work, management, security, power delivery, rackification, then on top of all those standardization, now we can bring in new features, new techniques, uh, such as memory pooling and such, such as large-scale uh, GPUs, large-scale TPUs. Uh, all those can still uh, run on a foundational software and security elements. That was, that was the last slide. Again, thank you very much. We're glad to take questions, a few questions, and by the way, you know, always fun to present with a good friend, so thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so Mark and I and Sonia Mack, I'd like to uh, thank you for staying with us for those long two days. Um, this is a new, uh, new trial for OCP to do the engineering tracks over two days, but it did allow a lot more content, and I think uh, the feedback has been really positive, so hopefully we can continue to do that and provide more content in the engineering tracks. Uh, yeah, I, actually, uh, you guys uh, might already know, uh, Mark and John are the co-chairs of the uh, server project, and um, that's where basically a lot of contributions happen, and they foster uh, contributions as you come in with contributions that will help you um, um, provide feedback, guide you through the processes through CLAs, FSAs, um, contribution process, presenting those to the project team, presenting those to the incubation committee. It's a lot of work that, that they do. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone.